There's a lot of hurry up and wait. There's always a moment of like anxiety. Feel right before you pull the trigger. Of like, okay, there's gonna be some recoil. There's gonna, you're gonna feel it. It's gonna be a loud noise. I'm Nathan Sychek. We're building a giant space cannon to help colonize the solar system. Just a million times easier to make a big ass cannon than a, a fancy rocket. So that's sort of the, the thesis of the company is we can make launch cheap by making one really big infrastructure investment and then everything else after that is really easy. The basic idea is it's a pneumatic cannon that has a large number of stages to accelerate a projectile from standstill up to orbital velocities, 8.5 kilometers per second. And the challenge with that is that there aren't gases that go 8.5 kilometers per second. So you can't just push from behind on the projectile. Um, the maximum speed even of uh, hydrogen is something in the neighborhood of like five kilometers per second. So we squeeze from the sides. The tricky thing that this company does, is we're gonna have a very long tapered tail off the back of the projectile, and we'll have side injectors that squeeze the projectile down the barrel and that basically lets you, you know, if, you're, if your tail has a 10 to one ratio on the angle, then you can go 10 times faster than the gas that's impinging on your projectile. So that lets us actually get up to orbital speeds. For a space launch system, instead of building a roughly, you know, kilometer long system, we will need many kilometers. Minimum 10, probably closer to 15 kilometer long accelerator. All right, so yeah, so we're here in Oakland. Um, this is Longshot's campus. What we have over here is our tech demonstrator accelerator. It's 60 feet long-ish. This is the kick stage, and then we have three booster positions to continue the acceleration after the kick. Basically, this U-shaped pressure vessel gets pressurized up to 850 PSI, and while the barrel is evacuated, put a projectile in the barrel, insert connector segment, pressurize this up, pop a burst disc, the projectile starts going down the barrel. As we go down, there's a spot here where we've got another booster that will continue accelerating the projectile, and another one here, and another one here, and then the projectile hits the, uh, the safety safe. When we first did a shot, I don't know, you can probably see on the back here, on one of our first shots, we thought, oh, we've got this like 800 pound safe, we'll be fine. It was not fine. Not the safe on its butt blew the door off on our, one of our first shots. First put this in here, the safe was like two feet from the wall and then it hit the back wall. And then it actually turns out that the whole shipping container used to be about a foot away from the shed wall outside. And then that got pushed against the shed wall and is now bending the steel of the shed wall. So we've done like 75 shots on this thing. You know, if you just keep hitting this thing with a hammer, it'll eventually, uh, it moves. I've always thought that space is an obvious future for humanity. Grew up on, well, on science fiction, Star Wars, Star Trek, lots of books in that direction. My, my father was a big fan of hack science fiction, so I had a beautiful education growing up. And around 2000, I saw a talk by this guy named John Hunter, and he wanted to build a light gas gun that was suspended below an oil derrick that you could take out in the ocean and tuck it around and shoot in any direction you want. And I thought, this guy's a technical genius, and he is never gonna raise money for that. But that idea of like, rockets are cool, they're also really expensive and fragile. Maybe there's a different way of putting stuff into space. That's where that brain worm kind of entered my cranium. Much later, it matured into a thought of like, okay, maybe this is the thing I could do where I could have an impact, where I, I could try and make this real. And, and that turned into long shot. I remember the moment the technical architecture came into my head when I was trying to avoid working on my master's thesis. And I called NATO, I was like, oh, NATO, NATO, I just had an idea. It's gonna be, this is how we're gonna do it. Yeah, NATO deals with those phone calls for me still to this day, all the time. When I was like seven, I had a little journal in which 
I wrote down all of my inventions that I was going to make, and it was things like, I'm going to build a spaceship to launch garbage into the sun, and I'm going to make a battery that has unlimited energy, and, you know, ridiculous things. Uh, but basically, at the time, my only context for what that meant was an inventor. So at, at the time, I thought I was going to be an inventor and then decided I wanted to be an astronaut. Eventually realized when I got to college that astronauts don't build things really, and but I still wanted to be in space. So I, I studied aerospace engineering with the, the intention that I would build a rocket. I was early employee at Planet, then came back over, worked at Stranus, then most recently at Astro, where I was a integration lead and actually got to finally build rockets. And I thought that was the coolest thing ever until I talked with Mike and uh, he basically convinced me that this was gonna have a much bigger impact on humans' future in space. The exercise starts in 2021 when I found the company. My wife gives me a six month lease on life. I can earn no money. I'm okay for six months, she'll cover it. I use that entire time period to raise 20 grand so I can actually try and build a prototype that's basically a piece of irrigation equipment that can put a pool noodle up to Mach 1.8. Going forward, we land a $750,000 contract with the Air Force, and that's really what cracks the company open. So with that money, we're able to raise 2.5 million bucks in VC. And with that money, we're able to build basically what you see here. So 2.5 million bucks VC gets us to basically mock 4.6, 4.2, if you want like a more repeatable thing, but like 4.6 is something came out the end of the thing of a projectile, kind of what was left of a projectile. That's the fastest we've ever accelerated anything before. This is basically here as a technology demonstrator that we could use to fire a projectile from one end to the other. And we've got three boosters that add gas directly behind the projectile as it moves down the barrel with much less than uh, a millisecond of delay from when we want the booster to open to when it's actually releasing gas. There will be some period of time where we have some downtime and we're being relatively thoughtful as a company, and then we'll get into a testing campaign. And then the pressure sort of ratchets up. That's the time when the company needs to have all of its activities coordinated. People need to be working together. Doing a test campaign is a lot of work and we need to be building projectiles, building burst disks, testing systems, adding sensors, integrating data, doing analysis. There's a lot of things that are happening and there's we try and do it on a, on a high cadence. So we're doing you know a couple shots a week, ideally. So these burst disks are what are holding back high pressure gas. And then uh, once we trigger them to pop, uh, they flower open like this, allowing the gas to flow into the barrel and uh, propel the projectile forward. We can uh, control what pressure we want them to pop at based on the score geometry and how deep we score it basically what pressure can hold at before it pops, and then how close to its ultimate failure point uh, we can get it, and then we trigger it to pop uh, within a certain target range. Hey Gus, before you head out, you want to let the neighbors know there's going to be some noise? Yes, sir. It's a lot of hurry up and wait. There's always a moment of like, Anxiety. Uh, I mean, if you've been to a firing range, the feel right before you pull the trigger, like there's some some anxiety. Of like, okay, there's going to be some recoil. There's going to you're going to feel it. It's going to be a loud noise. There's like a visceral feel to it, um, and it's it's the same thing here. There's a very visceral feel when the when the thing goes. doing a shot, going and looking at the high-speed footage, looking at the sensor data, and seeing that thing that we were worried about, like that was not a concern, but this other weird thing happened. Why did that happen? Uh, like, oh, this sensor went out, shit, so we didn't get that data. Okay, we're gonna have to redo that part of the test on the next shot, or things like that. Just uh, looks like we hit the wall. Well, it looks like it, except for everything. This will pull it down away. So oh, oh, the hole. The hole, all the, all the carpet. Oh, oh, oh. So I think it hit and just, where impact, it was slightly less dense over there, and so it skewed. It skewed, which it does habitually. As right? an engineer, that's the like meat and potatoes, and my you know some of my favorite parts of working here is that it feels like we're being scrappy, and we're not wasting time, money, effort on things that don't matter. The smell is burnt carpet, so our our catch box is full of carpet, 
And when the projectile hits it at Mach 2 plus, Mach 3, uh, the nylon basically slags. <laughs> Here, let's move back a little bit. For me, it's now kind of a nostalgic smell, I guess. Like, almost all of our shots for the past two years have smelled like this. So it's a... Uh, yeah, it's it's just it's a smell of uh, it's a smell of a shot. We're in Oakland, so we're sort of limited in the system performance in a variety of ways. One of them is we have limited real estate. We've only got about a 60 foot long shed, and we're limited in the gas choice we can use. We basically can't use hydrogen, which is what we'd like to be using. Uh, we're limited to non-explosive gases. So we've been firing this thing with helium and we have gotten up to the sort of theoretical max performance we can get with helium. 40% efficiency is outstanding for a light gas gun. We're at 40% efficiency, which means we've gotten a lightweight projectile up to Mach 4.2. And that's what we set out to do and we're, we've, we've done it. And now we're gonna go build a much bigger system out in Nevada where we can use hydrogen because we're in the middle of nowhere and it'll be much safer and faster. For the system in Nevada, we're gonna be going much larger. So we're building this test rig um, to test burst disks that are in the 22, 24 inch scale. So uh, this is just getting welded up and eventually we will have burst disks that we put on here and we'll pressurize the interior volume and, and pop them and, and test that whole system out. Now we're transitioning to a system that's not 15 meters long, but it's gonna be 500 meters long out in the desert. We're hoping to shake that system down mid-2025. There's going to be a gun out in the desert that is roughly about a factor of 30 larger than any gun human beings have ever built on the planet Earth before. It's gonna be notable. It's gonna be big enough that I could slide you down it very easily, right? We're talking about close to a meter interior diameter. So lay the slip and slide out, put some canola oil on the thing, and woo, off you go. But basically we're hoping to break ground in November-ish. We'll have a facility there for uh, building the cannon. We'll have shop space, office space, and then we'll build out this giant cannon with a large number of boosters. The goal for that system is to bring 100 kilograms to Mach 5. It won't initially get this speed, but I think that system could be expanded up to Mach 15, which is like half of orbital velocity, maybe a little bit more than half of orbital velocity. The customer for that's DOD. Like they want to test their hypersonic zoomy boomies. They want to get really into the hypersonic heat shields and stuff like that. And right now you could buy a rocket or you could stick it in my big potato gun out in the desert and get a test. I'm hoping to use the momentum from that and the customers that we get out of DOD to basically leverage up into the next thing. That thing we're building out in the desert, like half a kilometer long, biggest gun ever, tinker toy. I don't care about it. I hate how small it is. It upsets me makes me feel inadequate. I must have something that is even girthier. For a space launch system, instead of building a roughly, you know, kilometer long system, we will need many kilometers. Minimum 10, probably closer to 15 kilometer long accelerator. And the only real difference between a Mach 15 system and a Mach 25 system is those extra eight and a half kilometer long infrastructure that we need to build. So just take the layout for the system we build here in Nevada, build it to the length where you can put stuff into space and not small stuff, big stuff. And for that, we're looking at Northern Australia because this system is gonna be really loud and Northern Australia is very unpopulated. Crappiest thing we think we could build that would get stuff to orbit would be about a two meter diameter projectile that would weigh somewhere in the neighborhood of 3000 kilograms and would have about 500 kilograms of payload. When you fire the cannon, it'll take about two seconds to leave the barrel and then another 10 seconds or so to get through the bulk of the atmosphere. And then you'll be at orbital altitude in less than a minute. You fire your cold gas thruster for less than a minute and you're, you're in orbit. If the stars align, I, I think that we could be trying to put stuff into space. 2028, 2029, something like that. Actually trying to deploy payloads to space out of this thing. Once we do it once, it will seem like obviously that's the way to do it after the fact. That's the smallest thing we think could send stuff to space. We have to build that system because that's all the money we can raise. That's what we'll do. We would much rather build sort of a, a point design that's more of a, a mature launch system instead of 500 kilograms of payload will have about 40,000 kilograms of payload. And that would basically be, we'll send a shipping container to space. Literally like an ANSI standard shipping container 
pack it with whatever you want, and we'll send that to space. That's how you get it so that when you wanna build something on the moon, and you're like, we need to send a whole bunch of excavators to the moon, you go talk to Caterpillar, and you have them swap out the diesel engine for an electric drivetrain, you stick those things in shipping containers, you stick the shipping containers in the freaking gun and shoot it to, to the moon. This, this was in the gun, and now uh, it went into the catch box, and now into my hand. Chunks of projectile. In general, seems like it was a successful test shot. We got data from the sensors that we were testing. So that means in some sense, it was a successful shot. The goal was to gather data and we have gathered the data. The data tells us that our sensors are wor working perfectly or we need to tweak something. We'll find out. And, uh, but you know, uh, what is it? Uh, progress leads to perfection or something like that. <laughs> is that. Is that the phrase? What is it? Something like that, right? Progress, not perfection, I think is what Oh, is what you're supposed to say? That's what you're supposed to say. Oh, yeah, progress, not perfection. Right, we don't have perfection, but we do have some progress. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So far, so good. We'll keep plugging away. <laughs>